I, what, what did you do to work out your own interpretation of the part? Well, all I could do was... I mean, I couldn't copy anybody, and I couldn't, you know, create a part out of the ether. I just went back to the books. The books were what started it all. They gave rise to the first films, and Ian Fleming had created that character, so I studied the books, and tried to bring that bond into the... Uh, the scripts that Michael Wilson and Richard made down the Well, without being over-analytical and going, becoming too deep about it, what, what, how do you see Bond? What sort of, of a person is Bond then? Well, it's interesting. Um, uh, Cubby's wife, Dana Broccoli, um, was down in the, in the basement of the office the other day and, and pulled out some old cartons full of, you know, old dusty papers. And among them were some unseen Fleming notes. He described uh, Bond as a blunt instrument of government, as a man who is... Um, dangerous, ruthless, uh, morbid, relentless, tenacious, a man who would sometimes, uh, determined to get on with his job, but who would sometimes, if he saw a woman who was in danger, he would sometimes rescue her, but then again, sometimes he wouldn't. <laughs> Whether you were a fan of his interpretation or not, the fact of the matter was that Timothy Dalton took Bond into a different direction. Gone were the fantastical days of the cartoony, outlandish and untouchable super spy and here entered a ruthless, gritty human professional who operated in a realistic world of espionage. And fans seemed to love it, but lots of mainstream audiences didn't seem to like this new approach. They deemed it too gritty and realistic. Ironically, that is exactly what today's Bond films get praised for. But those who thought that the living daylights was too gritty would see it pale in comparison to what was coming next, as it would be followed up by the darkest and most violent Bond film to this date. Oh, and just a heads up, this is my favorite one. to kill the 16th 007 adventure is not the usual bond dose of escapism instead a tale of the nasty times we live in license to kill the first bond film to not have a fleming inspired title and receive a pg-13 rating it would even get a censored version before the uncut original was released years later the title was originally going to be license revoked but the producers feared American audiences wouldn't know what the word revoked meant. If you take the inflation into account, this was the least financial successful Bond film in the series. But I think a lot of that has to do with its poor marketing campaign as well as having to compete with a ton of blockbusters in the summer of 89. Of course it also had to do with the dark tone and gory scenes and high measure of violence. You could say that License to Kill was really ahead of its time. I consider it an overlooked and absolute gem of the franchise. By the music of the gun barrel alone, you can already tell that things are about to get more intense than usual. We open up in the Bahamas. Some major Latin drug lord by the name of Fran Sanchez seems to be out in the area for the first time in years. The DEA has now finally got a chance to capture this untouchable Tony Montana-like King of the Hill. Meanwhile, Bond is out with Felix Leiter, who is about to get married, and for the first time in history, an actor reprises his role of Felix Leiter, as David Hedison, who previously played Leiter in Live and Let Die, returns. Bond is the best man in the wedding, so it's immediately shown that Bond and Leiter are not just business partners when they're out on missions, but they're also grown to be close friends in their private lives. Meanwhile, a DEA helicopter shows up to pick up Leiter, as apparently Felix is not working for the CIA anymore, but is now a DEA agent. He gets informed that Sanchez is in the area and that they get this once-in-a-lifetime chance to capture him. Bond, of course, joins in to assist Felix, so immediately this Sanchez is set up as quite the important villain. It turns out he's in the Bahamas just because his girlfriend is sleeping around with some random dude. And when we're introduced to him, as portrayed here by Robert Davi, oh boy, you know that shit just got real. What did he promise you? 
his heart. Give her his heart. No. No, Franz. It's all right, baby. No te preocupes, eh? We all make mistakes. Your escapades are getting more creative. Por favor, Franz. Not a word. <laughs> Remember how only two films ago things started out so light-hearted with Bond in a strikingly white outfit snowboarding away with the song of the Beach Boys playing in the background only to escape in a submarine disguised as a glacier? Now we're only three minutes into this film and we're introduced to a drug lord who beats up his girlfriend with a whip while the guy she was sleeping around with is screaming his lungs out in the background because Sanchez's men are about to cut out his heart. This ain't Moonraker, folks. So Bond and Leiter arrive on the scene and chase down some of Sanchez's goons, who all quickly run off. Bond briefly meets up with Sanchez's girlfriend, Loopy, who is, by the way, played by the insanely hot Elisa Soto. I mean, come on, guys. Damn. I mean, even nowadays, he just still, uh, manages to direct the blood to different parts of your body. Anyway, Sanchez makes an escape and Bond and Leiter chase after him in their helicopter. And this film is often critiqued for being so influenced by Miami Vice and Scarface. But really though, Bond films are often influenced by movies of their times. The whole black exploitation influence that we had, the karate films, and even Star Wars. At least this time it's not so shoehorned in. And besides, there's still plenty of typical James Bond moments in there too. Like this one, where Bond drops down the helicopter to grab Sanchez's plane. This is the scene that inspired Christopher Nolan for his opening of The Dark Knight Rises. It's just classic. And Michael Kamen adds a fantastic Latin Bond theme to the scene. John Barry was no longer on board to arrange the soundtrack, but man does Kamen rock too. So they capture Sanchez and Bond and Leiter parachute down and arrive at Felix's wedding in style. It's a fantastic opening. We get the opening titles and the first few chords of the song are like an updated 80s rendition of the Goldfinger theme. And yes, the title song by Gladys Knight, it's another one of my favorites. After the title, Sanchez is convicted by the DEA and Bond and Felix are having happy times at their wedding. The friendship between Bond and Leiter is further solidified to us when Bond receives a special present that does become part of the plot much later. A genuine Felix Leiter. Sanchez has meanwhile bribed DEA agent Ed Killifer to help him make an elaborate underwater escape. And once again, this is another scene that inspired Christopher Nolan with The Dark Knight. Seriously Nolan, if you're such a big fan of the franchise, direct a Bond film one day. So Bond leaves the happily married couple and Dalton once again shows that he put a lot of Fleming into his take on Bond. You know the tradition? The next one who catches this is the next one who... No. Thanks, Stella. It's time I left. Oh, James. <laughs> Did I see something wrong? He was married once, but it was a long time ago. It's a great reference to Bond's past and it reminds us that we're still essentially watching the same character here. Of course Felix can't wait to start his wedding night, but Sanchez's goons show up to take revenge by capturing him and raping and murdering his wife. Hopefully in that order. I did mention that this film was dark, right? So meanwhile, Sanchez is out in a warehouse of one of his men named Milton Crest, who runs one of the many drug operations for Sanchez. And it's here that we learn about an important character feature that Sanchez has. Something you better understand, amigo. Loyalty is more important to me. Yes, loyalty. This is one of the most interesting aspects of our main villain. Despite Sanchez being a very powerful and ruthless drug lord, he is a man of his word, so he does actually pay $2 million to Killiver, the DEA agent that helped him escape earlier. But he does show us once again that we don't want to mess with him. Where's my wife? Don't worry. We gave her a nice honeymoon. Yeah! Yeah! I 
want you to know this is nothing personal. It's purely business. See you in hell! No. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. So Felix gets fed to a shark and gets his freaking leg bitten off. It once again shows us that things are really serious this time. Audiences who had gotten used to the child-friendly Roger Moore Bond films could have said that this is a bit too brutal for a James Bond film. But what they got, however, was a taste of the source material, as this scene is directly taken from the Live and Let Die novel. Bond is about to fly off to his next mission again when he learns that Sanchez has escaped. He immediately rushes to Felix's house to find his wife murdered and Felix being barely left alive. They even included that note that was there in the novel as well. He disagreed with something that ate him. Dalton is really good in this once again. You can really feel his emotion and anger pulling through in the scene. Sanchez has already left the country so the DEA has no jurisdiction to capture him and plenty of countries will protect him. It further shows us how powerful and untouchable this drug lord really is and how little Bond can really do about the situation. So Bond and Felix's friend Sharky go out to search for warehouses that have sharks in the nearby area and they end up at Crestus Warehouse, who claims to have no sharks there and pretends to be some sort of noble third world feeder. So Bond sneaks in the same warehouse again at night only to find out that cocaine is being smuggled there and Bond ends up disabling a guard using his most devastating weapon yet, worms. He ends up taking down more guards, but is soon held at gunpoint by the corrupt DEA agent Killifer. Fortunately, Sharky accidentally comes to the rescue and Bond shows us his cold-blooded side again. There's two million dollars in that suitcase. I'll split it with you. You want it. You keep it, old buddy. No! God. What a terrible waste of money. The next day, Bond is brought to a mysterious location where M is pissed off at Bond for disobeying orders and going on a private vendetta. This private vendetta of yours could easily compromise Her Majesty's government. Then you have my resignation, sir. We're not a country club, 007. Effective immediately. Your license to kill is revoked, and I require you to hand over your weapon. And thus, a unique and completely different storyline is set in place. Bond disobeys M's orders and becomes a rogue agent. This time he's not sent out on a mission, but he has a personal objective to avenge his best friend and use his skills to go after one of the most dangerous drug lords in the world. It's an inspiring setup. Meanwhile, Sanchez's girlfriend Lupi is on the wave crest, Crestus boat, and Crest totally looks like he wants to rape the shit out of her, but doesn't, cause Sanchez. Crest is portrayed as a real slime ball that you quickly start to hate. Anthony Serby is perfectly casted for him. He's another character lifted from a Fleming short story, by the way. So Bond manages to sneak aboard the boat disguised as a manda ray, which is at least a lot more plausible than using a crocodile submarine. He sneaks into Lupi's cabin and once again shows us that he doesn't mess around either. He tries to learn where Sanchez is located, but his girlfriend doesn't know anything. She keeps her mouth shut though and never tells Crest that Bond is aboard. And then the pajama arrives. That's the name of the boat, the pajama. It turns out that the goons have killed Sharky and Bond makes an extremely satisfying harpoon kill to make up for that and escapes by diving into the water. I can't help but think that Roger Moore's Bond would just have been banging Loopy in her cabin instead had it been him. Crest orders all his goons to go search for Bond underwater and Bond starts foiling Sanchez's drug smuggling business by ripping open all the cocaine packs. Some great underwater fighting that rivals Thunderbolt ensues and then Bond makes an escape that only Bond could make. Seeing Bond water ski behind a plane using a harpoon makes for one of the best action scenes of the film. We're watching a very realistic dark film, but Dalton completely sells that Bond is skilled enough to be able to escape in such an elaborate way. 
He gets on the plane, manages to throw out both pilots and flies off with a shitload of drug money. It's a great scene. Still though, Bond is a rogue agent. Where does he go from here? He can't just go to a random MI6 contact to get another lead. He has to get to Sanchez somehow, so he starts snooping around on Felix's computer and finds a lot of informants who've all been working undercover to get to Sanchez. And all of them have been killed, except for a certain P. Bouvier. It also seems to be after Sanchez. Felix had a meeting scheduled with this person at the Bimimi bar, so Bond goes there to meet this person, who turns out to be our Bond girl by the name of Pam Bouvier, played by Carrie Lowell. A real tough girl with some special skills. Not only does she have a history as a CIA agent and pilot, but apparently she's able to smuggle freaking shotguns into a bar without it getting noticed. Also at the bar is Dario, Sanchez's right hand man, played by Benicio del Toro, starring in one of his first roles here before becoming an international movie star, and he's great in this. Dario is not particularly strong or special for that matter, all he really does is pull out a knife in a signature way, but he has a certain look and attitude going for him that makes him stand out. He looks like just another Latin fuck from the street that has stuck around with Sanchez for years and became a high ranking member in his organization because of his loyalty. Bond easily knocks him out with a simple punch though and a complete bar fight follows where everybody goes berserk. They even use a freaking sword fist. Pam uses his shotgun to blast a hole into the wall and they escape on their getaway boat. And there is some forced romance here that seems to come out of nowhere though. I mean, the one moment Pam is all, Look pal, I was an army pilot, I have flown into the toughest hellholes of South America and I will not have you lecture me about professionalism. And the next moment is all, well, why don't you wait until you're asked? Well, why don't you ask me? Mm. You see what I mean? But to be fair, the film does play on this romantic destiny of two people ending up together who are both after this untouchable drug lord with little to no resources. Oh, and the romantic music in the background helps too. Sanchez's influence is continued to be shown as we are introduced to the fictional South American country of Ismus, which is pretty much completely controlled by Sanchez. He owns the bank there as well as the casino, and he even has the president of the country in his pocket, who is by the way played by Pedro Amadaris Jr., the son of Pedro Amadaris Sr., who starred in From Russia With Love. He should be. He's my son. Fortunately, Bond has that shitload of drug money that he stole from the plane and there is an amusing scene of Bond making a deposit at the bank. I've come to make a small deposit. I'm sure my people downstairs are quite capable of it. Please sit down. And Pam gets a makeover to pose as Bond's personal secretary and she's one of the few women I can think of that actually looks so much harder with short hair. More of Sanchez's creative ways of making money are shown as there is an undercover television program which is supposedly for raising money for charity, but in reality it's for the buyers who can respond to buying the product. It just adds more and more to the overwhelming influence Sanchez seemed to have everywhere. Meanwhile Bond is out in Sanchez's casino and being a natural in card games, he quickly starts winning a lot of money at the tables and intentionally raises the attention that is quickly put on him. Sanchez sends Loopy down to take over as the dealer and she warns Bond to leave the country while he still can. Bond of course wants to meet Sanchez and orders her to take him to the top floor. The scene where the two finally formally meet is just great. Why this? In my business you prepare for the unexpected. And what business is that? I help people with problems. Problem solver. I'm more of a problem eliminator. <laughs> <laughs> Bond finds out that Sanchez is sitting behind armored glass and cannot be easily assassinated. And now that Bond has formally introduced himself to Sanchez, they are bound to find out that he is a former British agent when they check him out, bringing Bond at an even bigger disadvantage. And then there's also a mysterious Chinese businessman who is constantly shadowing Bond everywhere in and around the casino. We don't know what that is about yet either. And so the plot continues to build intrigue and you end up being completely pulled in to see how Bond is gonna take on this invincible drug lord in this impossible position. When Bond and Pam arrive back at their hotel, they are informed that Bond's supposed uncle has arrived. Immediately sensing trouble, Bond prepares to face a hitman that is probably sent to take care of him. 
but it turns out it's actually Q who was secretly sent out there by Moneypenny to assist him on his mission. So Bond receives some gadgets to aid him, including a sniper rifle with a palm reader so only Bond can fire the gun, along with some explosive toothpaste that Bond can blow up by remote control. This is definitely the movie that features the most of Desmond Llewellyn as Q as he gets a lot of screen time in this one. The next night, Bond goes back to Sanchez's casino and tells Pam that he had helped her enough but works better alone. I cannot say it enough, but Dalton just constantly makes sure that the novel Bond shines true in his portrayal. He's really good. He continues to use his wits to get to Sanchez as he poses as a waiter to get in an elevator taking him to the rooftop of the building. Speaking of shining true in a portrayal, Robert Davi is brilliant as Sanchez and is arguably the best Bond film the series have ever had. He has shown this root side the enormous influence and his great appreciation for loyalty, but he also showcases a surprisingly charming side as he is constantly making witty one-liners or jokes to charm the people around him that he's doing business with. This is uh, an historic moment. East meets West. Drug dealers of the world unite. <laughs> Time to have some fun. Yes. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> While Sanchez is having a meeting with Asian drug dealers, Bond places the explosive toothpaste underneath Sanchez's window. So Bond gets to its vantage points and activates the explosive and is about to headshot the drug lord for good. But then he's attacked by a bunch of ninjas. And you're like, where the fuck did these guys come from? And damn it, Bond was so close to succeeding too. It turns out these ninjas were working for the mysterious Chinese guy who is named Quang and is an undercover agent for Hong Kong narcotics trying to expose Sanchez's biggest operation. And please don't ask me why a Chinese guy would have freaking ninjas working for him, as that is clearly, you know, a Japanese thing, but yeah. Bond is taken captive by this Quang, and on top of it all, the British Secret Service is also trying to stop Bond, and an MI6 operator shows up to take in Bond. Then Sanchez shows up and blasts the crap out of the building with a freaking tank, cause you know, since he pretty much owns the entire country, I'm not surprised the army is also under his wing, and so Sanchez finds Quang, who immediately immediately commits suicide and is confused to see Bond tied up in the building and thus Sanchez thinks that Quang blew up his office and the major plot twist comes in as Sanchez rescues Bond and takes him into his personal home. And god do I love Sanchez's mansion near the ocean, what a fantastic house. It was actually owned by a friend of Cubby Broccoli. Bond immediately uses this twist to his advantage and intentionally tells Sanchez that he is a former British agent. He knows that Sanchez is bound to find out about this sooner or later anyway and that he can win some trust by just telling it beforehand. I also really like how Sanchez reacts when his men do indeed find out about it. We're not gonna believe who this guy is. Former British agent. How did you know that? Because I know things. Bond also knows about Sanchez's thing for loyalty and he tries to use that against him by letting Sanchez believe that Crest is double crossing him. I mean this plot is just so cleverly written. Using the help of Loopy, Bond gets away from Sanchez's mansion and he sets his brilliant plan in motion by making a withdrawal from the bank and starting to frame Crest by planting all the drug money on board of his boat. As Bond was planning, Sanchez pays Crest a visit and his plan works flawlessly. Nobody's gonna believe that a guy came onto his boat and shot a harpoon behind the plane and stole all the cash. So Sanchez soon finds the cash that Bond planted there and he takes revenge by killing Crest in one of the most gory moments in the series. So the plan has worked and he quickly rushes back to Sanchez's mansion only to be rewarded for the information by Sanchez himself. And Bond continues to try and make Sanchez believe some of his own men aren't loyal. And to celebrate his plan succeeding, he also has sex with Sanchez's girlfriend. It's followed up by an infamous scene where Talisa Soto is always blamed for bad acting. If anything happens to him, I don't know what I'll do. You know, I love James so much.
And people are always saying, how could Loopy have fallen in love with Bond so quickly? It's bad acting. And I always feel the need to defend her on this, because of course she hasn't fallen in love with Bond. She's constantly shown to be sleeping around with men. Heck, by the end of the film she just runs off with the president, so no, she's not in love. She's just saying the line to taunt Pam. She has seen Pam together with Bond and the casino and she knows that Pam has a thing for him, so she just tries to be a bitch and taunts her a little bit. You can even tell by the way Q rolls his eyes when she tells Pam that she slept with Bond, and by the way this really annoys Pam. I love James so much. I'll be damned if I'll help him. Look, don't judge him too harshly, my dear. Field operatives must often use every means at their disposal to achieve their objectives. Bullshit! See, clearly Loopy even succeeded in taunting Pam. So, I rest my case. Talisa Soto may not be an amazing actress, but that line is just always interpreted the wrong way and has nothing to do with bad acting. And damn it, she is hot! I gotta defend this chick! So the next morning, Bond is taken to Sanchez's main distribution center, which is disguised as a headquarters of a religious cult. It is revealed that Sanchez has found a method to mix cocaine with gasoline so that he can smuggle loads of that stuff across the borders in tanker trucks. Unfortunately for Bond, Dario is also there, and he already knows that Bond can't be trusted. And so Bond is exposed, and Bond quickly blows up the laboratory, and everybody panics. So Sanchez puts Bond on the conveyor belt, and Bond continues continues to make Sanchez believe that people in his organization are not loyal. And Daffy plays that so well. You can see that he's slowly becoming paranoid and begins to lose trust in all his own men. It's great acting. It results in Sanchez brutally killing more of his own guys. Bond is just rescued by Pam and Dario meets his doom in a giant cocaine shredder. So the whole place blows up and Sanchez and his goons escape in cars and the cocaine laden tankers. Bond and Pam start pursuing them by plane and the film gets into the final climax action scene. Bond is dropped onto one of the tankers and he jacks it and there is a ton of great action featured here. Missiles are fired, a truck driving on one side of the wheels, major explosions that really rival all the action movies of the time and on top of it all you can really tell that Dalton did have a hand in a lot of the stunt work. Bond ends up destroying the cocaine tankers, further handing out major blows to Sanchez's organization. Brilliant! Well done, Franz. Another $80 million write-off. I guess it's time to start cutting overhead. Another highlight to the scene is Bond doing a wheelie with a truck, with the amazing Latin version of the Bond theme playing in the background. It all ends with Bond and Sanchez falling down a cliff and juking it out in one final fight. And then Bond finally reveals why he has done all this. He pulls out Felix's gift and sets Sanchez on fire. It's absolutely brilliant. And so, Bond succeeds in avenging Felix and Pam rescues Bond. Later a party is held at Sanchez's former mansion and the only thing I don't really like is how things are just wrapped up so easily. Bond has a phone call with Felix and he's all happy like, ah oh, thanks for doing this for me bro, oh and M calls, you got your job back. Even though, you know, his wife was murdered and he lost his freaking leg. But besides that brief moment, Bonds ends up kissing with Loopy, which upsets Pam. And we all know that Pam was the ultimate main Bond girl, so he goes for her instead. Why don't you wait until you're asked? So why don't you ask me? And so this magnificent movie comes to an end. And no, I don't mind the fist giving the audience a blink at the end of the film. Who cares? And I really like Patti LaBelle's song running over the end credits. It always gives me this warm feeling of just having witnessed an amazing Bond film that gives us a fitting ending of what I consider the classic era of Bond films. And there you have it folks, my personal favorite Bond film. It's hard to articulate exactly why it's my favorite one. I think a lot of people assume that I think it's the best one too. It's close, but I wouldn't say it's the absolute best one. 
However, it is the one that I just enjoy watching the most. I think a lot of it comes down to it just being so different to all other Bond films. The power of License to Kill really shines true when you're familiar with the other Bond films that came prior to this, and you really see quite how different, dark and unique this one is in comparison. I love the idea of having Bond resign from the Secret Service and going on a personal vendetta to take down an untouchable drug lord in order to avenge a friend who we have seen in so many previous adventures. They just took this idea and just went all the way with it. Robert Davi's portrayal of Sanchez is another reason I enjoy this movie so much. He really is arguably the best villain the franchise ever had and because he constantly is featured throughout the movie, we are given plenty of time to warm to his ruthless but likeable character. Sure, this movie is dark and very gritty in places, but to me that is just so welcomed if you consider that seven light-hearted Roger Moore films were made shortly before this. I really enjoy this mature tone that the film went with, and I love the idea of mixing a crime movie with Bond. Sure, it's all very different, but it still has a ton of moments that really make it a typical James Bond film too. The stunts and action are fantastic, the soundtrack is amazing, and both Bond girls are great. Yes, Talisa Soto too. I would have gone for her at the end of the film personally. All in all, License to Kill is one of the most underrated Bond films with a brilliant plot and it really warms my heart to see how much appreciation this film gets nowadays, because in my opinion, it really is a masterpiece. Do you enjoy my recapping episodes and you just can't wait for the next one or other content coming up on my channel? Well, support me on Patreon and get access to my latest videos two weeks before the regular viewers get to see it, as well as a lot of other cool supporter rewards. You can find the link in the description and make sure you subscribe to my channel.